Hello, everyone. And welcome to the third Fibromyalgia Association Canada Awareness Week presentations. I am Trudy Flynn, Chair of the Board of Directors of Fibromyalgia Association Canada, or FAC. Thank you for joining us. Although we come together from many different places, I would like to acknowledge that the land I live on is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship with which Mi'kmaq and Wollastawik peoples first signed with the British crown in 1726. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wollastawik title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. In Nova Scotia, we are all treaty people. So before we get started, I just wanna cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any technical problems, please email webmaster at fibrocanada.ca. If you have any questions for Tyler, please put them in the chat and we will get to them after his presentations. presentation. We are pleased to provide captioning to accommodate the diverse needs of our audience. This presentation is being recorded for those who could not attend this live event and for our YouTube channel. We will be muting all participants to reduce the noise feedback. Another important note, many of our fibromyalgia community also have ME as a comorbidity. Some people with ME must be extremely careful with adding physical activity. Activities can trigger post-exertional malaise or PEM. Now I would like to introduce and welcome Tyler Dillman. Thank you, Tyler, for helping FAC educate people with fibromyalgia and for doing this presentation. As a physiotherapist and owner of One to One Wellness, Tyler's commitment as a healthcare professional is to create a safe environment for individuals to learn how to integrate healthy lifestyles, practices that enhance quality of life and increase participation in meaningful activities. Tyler is a graduate of Dalhousie University's um, Master's in Physiotherapy program and a bachelor, has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Mount Allison University and a Bachelor of Kinesiology from Acadia University. With interests in pain science, behavior change, therapeutic relationship, and chronic pain, Tyler's whole person philosophy to patient care is based on an understanding of an individual's health and how it's influenced by complex interaction amongst many biophysiosocial factors. Through listening and validating patient experiences, Tyler aims to create successful, unique and meaningful treatment plans to help optimize an individual's health. When not working, Tyler can be found spending time with his wife and two sons, exploring the hiking trails and discussing fantasy sports with his friends. Welcome, Tyler, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Trudy. Um, and I wanted to uh, thank uh, <clears throat> the Fibromyalgia Association of uh, for inviting me here today to speak about this, such an important uh, yet uh, challenging uh, topic uh, sometimes for, for individuals living with, with fibromyalgia. And um, uh, just to uh, let, let people know uh, as well, this is really based on, uh, meant to be educational in, in nature. And uh, so before kind of trying to maybe implement some of these strategies and um, what you learn today, it's, it is absolutely recommended to be discussing uh, this with, with your own healthcare providers um, and getting cleared for some of this. And uh, so as uh, Trudy mentioned, uh, I'm a physiotherapist and owner of One to One Wellness, and uh, <clears throat> we're here in uh, Bucktuck, uh, Nova Scotia. So, um, uh, today, what I'm, I'm hoping to to accomplish is to give you some information of how to get started. How to get started when you're experiencing 
uh, significant pain, uh, fatigue, and you're having difficulty going from the your bedroom to, to the living room or bedroom to the bathroom, uh, how do we build up uh, our confidence in our ability to do that? And how uh, do we feel successful in accomplishing that? And, and where are those starting points? Because that can be the kind of the make or break aspect of, of uh, so, um, what, uh, let me do that, a little bit more about me and my interests as well. Uh, Trudy had kind of gone through that a little bit and through my, my bio and, and my education, a little bit of my volunteer and, and work experience has uh, seen me in uh, volunteering in the Dorchester Penitentiary, the uh, psychiatric ward there uh, in university. And I've also was employed as a youth worker as also as a psychiatric attendant. And uh, for me, what that was able to to give me is insight and, and experience and seeing uh, the psychosocial uh, influences and, and how that can, can impact an individual's overall well-being and uh, access to care and access to resources become uh, so important. I also do uh, some guest lecturing up at the school, Dalhousie School of Physiotherapy, especially in uh, chronic pain week. And interest uh, kind of beyond uh, what Trudy had mentioned, one of the, my main one is the, the uh, atrogenic effect. And for those who aren't familiar with that, it is how uh, healthcare providers can uh, negatively or positively impact an individual's health based on our own attitudes and beliefs. And for the fibromyalgia community, that, that can be, um, uh, that is really important for us to, to consider, especially early on through the diagnostic uh, process. So, Rather than kind of going through like the definition of uh, fibromyalgia, I felt it'd be really good to start with uh, this uh, quote from a qualitative study and it's referenced at the end. And the reason why that I picked that because it, it is, uh, it gives insight, especially if there's healthcare providers watching this to the, the lived experience of, uh, of patients with, with fibromyalgia and if you're living with that and kind of the invisibility and, and the challenges that come and the frustrations, but also it, it, it shows almost the importance as well as what the Fibromyalgia Association of Canada is trying to do, is when you find that group and that community that's uh, saying the same thing and is able to empathize with you, um, it, it can improve kind of your overall quality of life and, and well-being as well. So, Felt like having this in here was was very important, kind of early on, just to set set that stage. So, um, not not alone going through this process, and uh, there's many people uh, uh, trying to to help. So, physical activity, and um, it is the main way uh, that we have, especially conservatively. Um, to manage uh, fibromyalgia symptoms. Okay, so we want to try to make sure that this is, uh, when we're implementing this early on, that is ex it is successful, as success successful as it can be. Um, and what we see is the, the predictors of this comes down to understanding the benefits and the barriers uh, that, that are present uh, in uh, from physical activity and uh, if with fibromyalgia, a uh, very key point is our confidence in our ability to be physically active, especially when we're in pain. Like how confident do you feel uh, in your ability to be active or do a, do a certain task? Like that's really important as well as our intention to be physically active. And, and most often what we, what we see is the intention is there. I want to be doing more. I want to be physically active. I want to be engaged. But the behavior uh, is um, of being physically active. Uh, there's, there's, there's a gap in between. And so what we try to do is just kind of fill that gap and make that gap a little bit, uh, a little bit less and a little bit less. And the education piece is really important. And that really comes down to more so that first point of understanding the benefits and, and what's out there uh, and with, with the barriers and what, what you have access to. And so why is it important? Why is activity and physical activity important? Well, what we see 
is it does reduce pain. It reduces fatigue. It also reduces cognitive uh, impairments. Uh, it also reduces the risk of comorbidities such as uh, depression and other uh, other comorbidities that are associated with a sedentary uh, lifestyle. And we do see an improvement in quality of life. And so that's kind of the, 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 the benefits of physical activity. The, uh, some of the, the barriers that, that come up and we'll talk a little bit more about later, it especially is around pain, uh, energy, and time, access to resources, uh, looking at the social determinants uh, of, of health. And so what we also see though, if we're not being, if we're not moving our bodies, uh, if we're not um, uh, kind of challenging them in a, in a subtle way, it can lead to worsening symptoms over time. Um, and that's not what we're looking for either. And the, the, the challenge is when we're trying to establish this type of uh, this behavior is consistency is the key. Most often where we start to see the, the effects of, of physical activity is uh, anywhere from 13 weeks to 52 weeks. That is a very long time. That is a very, very long time and can feel scary starting out. But that's not the level that we're trying to start at here. We're trying to establish uh, a, a sense of safety and establishing a routine to be able to incorporate this into your life successfully, because it is so very, very important. And so I didn't want to kind of do go into too much of the research. Uh, so I'm bringing kind of a research to reality uh, piece here. And I like to call this motivate to move a pain dilemma because pain is one of the most unmotivating factors <laughs> uh, to, to movement, especially when you do move, you do get pain. Um, and it's, it feels like our body's telling us no, but healthcare providers are telling us yes, and they may have given some, some information that led to more pain and, and flare ups and, and those types of things. So it is, uh, it can be very, very confusing starting out. So hopefully with this next session, this next section, we are able to um, kind of break through that a little bit and kind of building up confidence to be able to, to um, uh, get this, uh, get physical activity into our lives and get moving just a little bit more. And so I always like to start with the definition of pain because I feel like that's really important uh, because it's uh, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. And, and what that, uh, what that means is it's really kind of individual as well, right? It's, it's very much, we have to be thinking of uh, what our body is experiencing uh, for not only from a sensory point of view, like what we're feeling, but also kind of our fear, our anticipation, like our mood, all of those things really have to come uh, influence kind of the, the pain that we're experiencing. Uh, and then it's, uh, um, uh, we're resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage, right? So there's potential in there as well that we can we can start to to look at. Uh, and then chronic pain is that's lasting over over three months, and um, it can occur without a known cause you know, after an injury heal, and the condition has been treated. And so for the fibromyalgia community, this is would be in the, the chronic pain category. And um, what is can be important is just to know how we typically respond in movement with pain. And so what uh, we typically have is a painful event kind of at the top of that triangle. We get into a protective response, kind of the, the bottom right with kind of the robaxa set guy. And then we get into a correction of that, that movement. So we start to kind of move a, a little bit, a little bit more. And what's what we really uh, want to know from uh, even just kind of an individual perspective and also from a healthcare uh, provider perspective is what pattern do we typically get into when we're managing our pain and our and how we're moving and activity? Are we looking at some, are we helping somebody who is getting more into a protective state, right? And potentially avoiding activities or are we getting uh, somebody uh, is has a pattern of over uh, correcting, right? Doing too much, because what we see, and with this graph and the, the one at the top, and this is from the Explain Pain books from uh, um, uh, Butler and Mosley out of Australia, in the NOI group, 
uh, what we what we see is if we're uh, if we're doing too little, we're always using pain as our as as our guide without challenging it. Our our sensitivity to pain uh, becomes um, uh, it is it becomes easier to to turn on, and so that becomes really important here because if we don't challenge it in some way and feeling safe doing so, we can lead to a little less activity tolerance and uh, over time, our activity limit gets less and less. But if you go to the other end of the spectrum, kind of down in through uh, the bottom here, you get into these boom and bust cycles where you have all of the energy, you're having a relatively, um, uh, uh, you know, a relatively, um, good day with the, the pain levels that you're experiencing, you can use all of that, your energy, and then you kind of get into some flare up and you use all of your energy and then you get into a flare up. And that leads to a little bit of, it leads to increased sensitivity and ultimately activity uh, limits uh, decrease as well. So the ultimate goal here is for us to try to find some balance in between that's going to work for And so where do we start? Where, where, where's a really good starting point? Uh, like before you begin, kind of when you're, when you're trying to uh, establish ready, whether you're, you're feeling ready and you're feeling confident for uh, movement in your day, uh, maybe some strengthening your body in your day or getting up to, to, to move a little bit more throughout your day. Uh, ultimately setting goals is one of the, the main things that, that you can do. And they really have to be realistic. Okay, like really realistic. And that takes almost like a moment of a reflection of like, where am I right now? What am I confident in being able to do? Okay. And so starting, you know, being able to walk from the bedroom to the living room three times a day and then in, the, in, the, in two weeks time, that might be a really, uh, really nice starting point and a really nice goal for, for somebody to, um, uh, to start with, especially if their, their goals are looking to kind of increase their endurance and in, in their, their daily activities. Uh, and also, uh, maybe if that's not right, that's not the right starting point. Maybe we say, okay, I'm going to be uh, looking to be able to sit at the edge of my bed and, uh, and do a few seated calf raises and then uh, in two weeks time. And then I want to build that up to standing and, and so on. So we just want to make sure that the goals are very, very realistic and also transferable. Um, uh, the the exercise routine or the the physical activity routine will be transferable to the ultimate goals. Expectations are really key here as well. And uh, kind of going back to uh, the, to my previous slide with the with kind of avoiding pain and um, uh, kind of pushing through pain. Uh, we don't want to kind of hit either, but we can't completely avoid pain. Pain will be, it will be expected here, but there's ways to, to mitigate that risk and ways to structure and strategize this to try to make it feel a little bit more, more safe. And that's kind of the value of starting uh, uh, at a really low pace is, you know, what, what signals are we going to have to truly kind of listen to, which ones are going to impact our day and, and so on. And when you're looking at finding a starting point, uh, a realistic starting point. Uh, one of the, the bigger mistakes that are, is communicated to me uh, is I was doing this before, so I want to I want to start here. Okay, that's it. It, it really has to be around what are you confident doing? What are you confident in doing that it won't impact the rest of your day, that impact the rest of your week, and set you kind of into a flare? Like, is there fear that if you do a, a 20 minute walk or a 10 minute or a five minute walk that you're going to be impacted for the next two days? Well, then maybe we need to reevaluate that. Most often, what I would say is find that point that you feel confidence and then scale it back to about 50% of that. So if somebody came in and said, you know, I, I feel really confident that I can do a 10, 15 minute walk and I'll be okay. I usually, I usually kind of challenge that and say, do you know what? Let's actually scale that back and let's go five minutes in that day. And then let's slowly build that up. And, and the reason is, is because we're trying to establish again, that routine and that behavior and that sense of safety. If we, if, it, and you're kind of looking at the pros and cons of, uh, of, uh, and, and the risk of 
kind of potentially going into that that flare up and not uh, we want to kind of say okay let's start a little bit below that 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 confidence level let's make sure you're at least 95 98 99 percent confident that you could do five minutes and then you can layer that up and kind of really build up to that really confidence level and then it's, it could just keep kind of having that domino effect kind of moving forward of well, you know what, that was, that went really well. I had, I had some pain. It didn't impact my day. Okay. I'm ready to move up to five and a half minutes. You know what? I've done that for the, for the, for a week, I'm ready to move up to, to six, seven minutes at a time. And you can kind of build that up. We're, we're, again, we're, this is very like long term. We're trying to get this as consistent as, as possible. And uh, that doesn't mean starting with the activity guidelines that are recommended uh, by um, um, Health Canada, right? So those are those are maybe some goals that we could uh, work towards if it's um, if it's realistic, but it's not where we would want to be starting out at. Um, and I love before we kind of get into this movement uh, topic, I like bringing in this uh, this picture of our nervous system in a in a simplified way during these these types of presentations because uh, one, I, I think it looks really cool. And uh, and two, uh, it's it's really what we're trying to influence with a lot of this this movement is the response of our, our nervous system is having um, to to movement and how can we influence the nervous system in a very positive way, a nice calm way that's making us feel safe, uh, or are we doing things that are making it feel unsafe? And then how do we manage that? Okay, and then it also does a really nice it gives a really nice visual of there's a it's we're connected. Right, our 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 the, our hands are up connected into our shoulders. Our uh, it doesn't have the feet, but our feet are connected in through through the hips and the low back. So when we're when we're working in kind of incorporating a bit more movement, we don't always have to start at those the places that are are, are most sensitive. Right, if you have the most sensitivity and, and pain in kind of like your low back or your neck or um, uh, or your shoulders, we can start away and start to work a little bit a little bit towards. Um, again, just trying to establish uh, some some starting point uh, for uh, movement, some framework uh, and, and baseline. So, so some movement tips. Uh, what I usually like to start with is uh, kind of been along the line of somatic and under the principle of edge work. So somatic movements. If you're looking for some resources, uh, Thomas Hanna, Feldenkrais. Um, uh, Martha Peterson has some wonderful videos on, on YouTube as well. And sometimes uh, you may have to scale some of those movements back uh, as well uh, also. And so what I like about this is they are meant to be very calming. They're usually done uh, in uh, laying down uh, or, or, or sitting. And so that just provides a nice safe, um, a sense of safety just to begin with, because we're not really having to fight gravity as, as we're doing this. So a little less mus muscle tension uh, and uh, resistance there, which can feel really, really nice. And uh, edge work is, is really nice uh, in the sense that it allows us to kind of analyze our movement and seeing what we're, we're, we're if we feel ready for, uh, what we're priming our nervous systems for, for a little bit more um, resistance when we're kind of getting up and, and moving, um, maybe in sitting or, or standing. And so what the, the, the way that it typically works and the way that we guide people through this is you don't plow through the sensations that you're experiencing when you're doing some of the You hit the, the edge of it. You can take a deep breath. You can figure out, am I tensing my body when I'm going through this movement? Am I holding my breath as I'm going through this movement? Am I anticipating pain as I go through this? And you can become a little bit more curious. And that can help kind of uh, calm your nervous system down to maybe go a little bit further and tolerate a little bit, a little bit more. And we start with what feels safe. We're always kind of going into a movement that, that, uh, that feels successful and feels safe. So you, you kind of start in that, that place of safety and, and kind of challenge that sensation that, that you're experiencing. And ultimately, we're trying to make these uh, transferable to your goals. So you can kind of see the picture and see the um, uh, the kind of the building blocks to getting up and accomplishing this. So the next picture that I have is, is a little, what we call like feed in and out, right? And so 
uh, this, the way that this one works is it, you start to kind of move your ankle in and then you'll move your hip in. Uh, and then if you're starting to experience a little bit of tightness, tension, pain that you're unfamiliar with or not feeling comfortable or not feeling safe with, then you start to turn your ankle out and then you go back to that place of safety and then maybe turn a little bit further out. And so what's nice about a little movement like this is not only is it, it can be cognitively challenging trying to move our, our foot uh, without our hip, uh, but it, um, it also like these movements uh, need to occur in walking and sitting, uh, sorry, from sit to stand. Like these are muscles that are engaged during those. And so if we can start to challenge them in, in a little bit different of a way, in a little bit more safe of a way, we can start to kind of layer up on on top of on top of that, especially if it feels kind of successful. So, say you're having uh, one of uh, being able like picking things up off the floor. We could start with a deep breath. When you take that deep breath in, using your diaphragm, if it feels safe, you get a little bit of movement in through your low back. So you're getting a little bit of kind of arching with that that deep breath coming in. You're getting a little kind of flexion and, and uh, flattening as you as you breathe out and so you can start to exaggerate that movement and again those little those little spine and hip movements happen every step that we take every time that we're getting up uh, from from the toilet uh, and uh, getting up from our bed like all of those things are happening so we can start to kind of layer this movement up into some of those um, some of those goals strengthening strengthening tips um, this can be, uh, I would say a lot of people have had uh, negative experiences with trying to challenge their body and strengthening their bodies. And, uh, most often it's, it's no fault of, of their own. It's kind of just guided in a little bit, uh, um, I would say too quickly, uh, into, to strengthening their bodies, um, and, and some really kind of really uh, smart approaches that, that I feel to, to take here is to really start with small, small movements. And when I mean small, we, it, it starts really around with like isometrics. Like, can we, can you contract your muscle without the sense of, uh, you know, feeling like you have to hold your breath? Like, does that feel safe just to, just to contract your quad or contract your calf? How's that feeling? Right. Okay. That feels okay. It's not going through any range. And then you can start to go through a little bit more range of movement, right? You can put a uh, maybe a towel under your knee and kind of do a little quad over roll. And then you may say, okay, I, I, that feels safe. And then you can maybe, there's your, there's your, the front of your thigh, the back of your thigh, you can start to press your, your heel into, to the bed or the, um, uh, into the floor. And that feel that, that feels safe. That feels doable. And then you can start to say, okay, maybe I can do a little bit more in standing. Maybe it's a form of a mini wall squat or a sit to stand, maybe doing one or maybe two, and then kind of building up from, from there. And what's really important is that there's, when most of us think of strengthening, we're thinking kind of, uh, kind of like gym, TheraBand, weights, those types of things. And it's like three sets of 10, three sets of 12, those, now there's many modifiable variables here that we can work with. And depending on the individual, we can look at the repetitions and sets, but we can also start to look at things of like intensity. You know, how intense is that exercise for you? Uh, how long have we been going for? All of those are uh, modifiable variables just to even see, right? So if you say, even with an isometric contraction, you start out um, at uh, say, I'm gonna hold this for five seconds at a time, I'll do two reps. And then you start to kind of build up that 10 seconds. That is progress. That is progress when you're doing those, those types of things. Um, it, it doesn't always have to be that, that three sets of 10. And when we get to a certain level of uh, confidence and, um, uh, and, and tissue tolerance, there are three exercises that can work your 10 major muscle groups. So it doesn't have to be very time consuming. Um, which is a major barrier. And the three exercises can incorporate an upper extremity uh, push, uh, uh, upper extremity pull, and then a, a lower extremity push, so something like a mini wall squat and a squat. So those, those three, three types of exercises are able to get in your 10 major muscle groups, but that might not be the starting point. We might have to work individually um, and then kind of bring it all, all together. Important tip just overall with, with these types of uh, these types of things is really want to make sure that you're recovering well from it. 
It is a stressor. It is a stressor on our bodies. That's an addition. And so we really have to make sure that um, we're allowing the adequate recovery time to come in through there. But also very early on too, that recovery time is dedicated to how did how did I experience that? How did my body experience this um, um, this this strengthening or this movement? Uh, and all of that becomes just really important and really important information to have because maybe we started uh, a little bit too low. That's great, but maybe we started a little bit too high and we have to scale it back, especially early on. And th and that's okay. That that happens. It doesn't mean it was. Uh, it's it's not the right thing for you, but it does mean it maybe just wasn't the right starting point for you. And so this is just a little bit of a visual of some of the, the things that I was mentioning, uh, uh, kind of progression for say like a lower extremity strengthening, uh, the, the top uh, top left is, is pushing down into uh, the back of the knee down into the bed and just holding. Again, you can modify the intensity. Typically I've get people to start at about a 20, 25% of what they feel like they could do uh, maximally and just kind of holding that and being able to breathe. And then you could say, okay, can you go to 50% and then building up to like 75 or, or 80%. The next one is kind of starting to go through a smaller range of motion. So uh, having that uh, rolled up towel under, under there and starting to kind of go through a little bit of knee flexion. Um, and the, this little, this knee range is, it becomes really important uh, from you getting up from sitting, stairs, walking, those types of things. Uh, and then this is where it can intensity can really come into play. And uh, most often where I get people to start overall is uh, looking at uh, kind of staying like under like an anaerobic threshold uh, in just saying about a, I'd say more mild to moderate intensity feeling as we're going through there. And then uh, starting to kind of time people and, and how long that they can, they get to get to that point. Um, and then we can start to kind of add on a little bit more. And then something, uh, uh, kind of the bigger picture there on the right is kind of something along the lines of maybe a mini wall squat. Uh, just that starts to challenge the glutes, the hamstring starts to bring things together uh, a little bit. And that might not be until weeks down the line, right? That's, that's, that's probably not something um, uh, to, to start with if you're experiencing significant significant pain and, and having trouble with some of those those motions. That's probably um, a good few weeks down, down the line. And so I had mentioned a little bit earlier just about a, that evaluation, right? And was the activity safe and how do we know, right? And so the recovery time can be really important and this is kind of more from like a pain pain perspective. And so what, to, what we can look at is, you know, how was there pain in the moment? There, there most likely was, but how long did it take you to get back down to your baseline, right? Did it take uh, a couple of hours or did it take uh, 24 hours or did it take 48 hours? That's all really important information, right? So remember, if you're going back to how our body is responding to, the, the, to movement and activity and pain, um, it's, it's about challenging that. And what we're starting to kind of see through, mostly through our, our tendinopathy uh, literature, um, and, uh, but we're seeing kind of working into some of that pain and having a little bit of that, uh, like a little bit of recovery uh, or analyzing that recovery window is, is really important. So if somebody says, you know what, I had pain for like two hours, I would say that, that, that would be expected here. Right. We, we can we can if it felt OK and it didn't impact the rest of your day beyond that and you were still able to, to function and do all of the things that you wanted to, to do, then that's something that we might be able to challenge a little bit if it feels safe to do so. And but if it was, you know, over a day or uh, two days then we're probably going to have to scale that back a little bit. Um, we probably just just challenge your nervous system a little bit too much more than what it was ready for. Let's let things kind of return to your baseline and then and then come back and kind of to that overall daily impact. We do want to take that into account. We like we do not want to be uh, influencing other factors that are really important for you. Say you know kids, work, grandkids, family time, social time. All of those things are really 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 important. Uh, we want to make sure that. Um, uh, when you are experiencing <clears throat> these these bouts of pain, that uh, you, that your mental health is okay, and and those those types of things, and then we're looking at uh, at your overall energy as well, right? Are we 
if we see a, a decline in your in your energy over time, and as Trudy had mentioned, post exertional malaise can be common in with with uh, um, uh, or ME is common with uh, fibromyalgia. So it's something that we we just want to consider if if that's uh, uh, something that you that you're struggling with as well. Uh, but we we can just want to look at overall energy and and did that deplete a lot of the resources that you have, and then we build that up over time if if it all felt felt safe. And just a couple other factors to consider, right? We're dealing with the nervous system, okay? And so what, what can challenge our nervous systems that we might not be uh, aware of, right? So busy environments can be, can be a challenge. Are we sensitive to light? Do we maybe need to have blue filter glasses or, <laughs> excuse me, um, be in a, an environment where we can dim the lights down a little bit? Uh, noise is do are we have sensitivity to noise? Uh, maybe some um, noise cancellation headphones, or um, again, just finding a, a less busy time to be able to to do this. Or if it's a um, if you're in in your house and there's a, you have some have children that are running around, um, we may want to kind of find structure a time where you're able to to do this in, in a kind of a little bit more quiet environment if, if that's possible. And also looking at things like scents and and, and those types of things. Finding a finding a friend that or uh, somebody in, in in your community that you can partner with uh, and uh, and kind of make goals together of what you would like like to accomplish that that can keep us uh, accountable and kind of moving forward and uh, is just that support over over time and one thing that I, I typically recommend is do not change too many variables at once. And what that can look like is, uh, say somebody's doing the, the, the quad over roll exercise, they're starting to, um, they started maybe with one set, four to six reps, and now all of a sudden they're doing uh, three sets, four to six reps, right? And so that's a big jump, a big jump in, um, in overall kind of activity and overall uh, challenge level. And so you, what I typically recommend is um, a change one thing at a time, right? If you're going to be changing the, the, the amount of sets that you're doing, you probably want to do, like, uh, if you start one set, four to six, you could just start from going two sets to two sets of uh, three, two sets of four. So they're really the only, you get one more uh, repetition in there, and then you're able to kind of see if that you're able to tolerate that a little bit. Then you can kind of, kind of build up on those. Um, and so, it's, and also like you're looking at overall intensity and, and those types of things uh, as well. And so a couple of key takeaways uh, from, from this, uh, this presentation that I, I'm really hoping that you were able to learn uh, the benefits, right, of, of physical activity is, is really, really, really important. And it is a, a key management strategy. Uh, there are significant barriers in place, pain being one of the main, uh, main ones uh, to getting started. Um, if we can find a way to build your confidence in your ability to be physically active, uh, that can go such a long way. So finding that the starting point is so, so important. Um, and also having that, like the intention of, of exercise is really important. If there's no intention there, then it's a little bit more kind of, of um, discussion around some of the benefits and what you're experiencing and uh, how we can kind of uh, try to try to move you forward and feeling confident in your ability and, and trying to build up that, that intention. Pacing really is key. It is, it is one of the major factors here and kind of the guidelines that we see is around a 10% increase every two weeks with, with kind of challenging our nervous system. And, uh, um, and so it's, it's about going low and slow just keep that but that when you look at it over you know a three month period that's going to be some significant jumps in your physical activity levels and you if you're able to kind of keep layering that on it, it, it just continues to improve and you will have moments where you where you plateau and you just want to be able to kind of maintain there you want to be able to scale back um ask yourself what you're confident doing and then just start below that Right, really, really set. Try to set yourself up from for success. Um, the most often, I do see people overshooting their their tissue tolerance and are are quite surprised 
uh, when they they do ex have experienced some symptoms at a at a, a smaller um, like a smaller time frame or a smaller distance or a smaller intensity. And really focus on keeping it simple. Quality over quantity goes a long way, right? Uh, start with start with one and feel really safe with it, and then build up from from there. Feel like you're having really quality movement, and that it it makes sense uh, in a way that makes sense for you. And kind of to my previous point there, just be okay with scaling back. This is change over long periods. We're not looking to. Um, uh, to kind of keep pushing, pushing through and um, having a, a really adverse reaction that can uh, limit your ability to and, and your confidence to be able to be physically active over time. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I have some references here that guided this presentation today if anybody wants to uh, have, a, have a, a closer look at those. Um, and if there are any questions, uh, please, please ask away. Thank you, Tyler. That was very informative. And uh, <clears throat> I, I have a couple questions and then I'll go into questions from that we've been sent from people who couldn't attend. Sure. Um, what are somatic exercises? Uh, somatic exercises, it's a form of mobility that just focuses on uh, mostly how we're holding our, our like tension in our body. And so it's a form of just uh, becoming becoming body aware is, is the is the best way to do it. But what I what I do find is that it, it serves as like a safe way to be kind of analyzing movement and, and making it feel a little bit safe, especially when you pair it with that edge work principle. Um, so it, it, it just tends to be a little bit more gentle way of moving our body, uh, through some less range of motion. Um, and especially again, when we're, when we're listening to them. So. Okay. Could you mention again, the resources for the somatic exercises? So there would be, uh, Thomas Hanna somatics. I should have put this in, especially in the references, my apologies. Uh, Martha Peterson has a YouTube channel. I also think she has, has a book. Uh, and Feldenkrais would be uh, the other uh, resource for that. And that's kind of okay, thank you. And so what's edge work as we're moving on with that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, uh, I apologize if I wasn't quite clear on my description of that. It's uh, about challenging the, um, our, the pain that we're experiencing, right? And so when we're when we're using edge work, and if somebody was in in my room and we were kind of going through some some movement, I would be saying go to the edges of where you feel comfortable. Okay, so that movement, right? So if if like with say my wrist in particular, like if I had a movement here, it started to hurt. I wouldn't just push through it, right? And say, do you know what? That's that's as far as I can go, not where I feel safe. And then from there you can start to move back. And what we tend to see because we, the, the nervous system responds very quickly to mechanical, like just, just movement, it's, uh, we can see a little bit more range of motion that happens over time. But with edge work too, it's not only the sensations that we're experiencing with say pain, um, it's also, uh, are we expecting and anticipating pain, right? Are we starting to kind of tap into a little bit of, of, our, of the processes that have, have developed um, uh, maybe from like avoidance of, of the activity or we're just in, in a sensitive state. So we are able to kind of just say, okay, just take a deep breath. Let's try to reduce the fear and bring calmness at, at that movement, despite what we're, we're experiencing. Uh, Corey Blinkenstaff has a video in the San Diego pain summit that, that, that does a really good job of explaining this, uh, as well. I'd recommend that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Just one second. Uh, sure. Charlene said, thank you for this information. I've had many, many weeks of PT. I find it most frustrating when I become confident in a particular exercise or activity and then said exercise or activity causes a flare. Not sure mm -hmm. if I'm alone here. Oh, you certainly wouldn't be alone. Um, absolutely not. Uh, sometimes when when we get challenging our body, and if and I don't know the, the specifics, but 
uh, it doesn't quite make sense when we're doing the same thing. Uh, it feels safe one day and, and not safe the next. And um, uh, it's, uh, and there's so many factors that come into play with how uh, we need to uh, be kind of structuring exercise and movement and physical activity. Uh, again, kind of looking at like the recovery from the previous event. Uh, are there more life stressors? Where's our nutrition off? Did we have uh, more sleep uh, or there less sleep than we usually do? Um, all of those factors can come into play. And uh, sometimes it just, it, it really doesn't make sense, but we, we, it, it, is, it is very, very common. And kind of evaluating the, the, the pain um, can be really important there, right? Of, you know, was it how, how in the moment kind of, you can ask yourself, how dangerous is this, is this really? And that kind of comes through that reflection type of process and kind of building up, up slow as well. And uh, it was, how long was the recovery time from that? And what I would typically recommend in those instances is, okay, if, if it was kind of a 48 hour week or, if, uh, or more, we would just want to scale that back and build it up. And it's constantly, the, the, the challenges with this is it's rarely ever kind of consistent and linear uh, in kind of like the, the progressions and what we're doing. It's kind of, it's wavy, it's wavy. And so that's kind of the, the point of kind of being able to kind of scale that, that back. So would you ever recommend breath work being paired with physical exercises? Uh, y yes. Yeah. I usually recommend, uh, some form of just, uh, a, a deep breathing, uh, exercise that, that works for them. Um, and I find like with, uh, especially in like the breath work and using kind of some gentle movement, it, it not only determines how you've, uh, not only brings calmness to our nervous systems and our bodies, we see a lot of, uh, um, uh, benefits from in incorporating like mindfulness and uh, those types of things. Uh, but it also can serve as uh, a tool of how we're responding uh, and how our body's responding to different stressors, right? If we're noticing a movement is a little bit more tense or a little bit more painful uh, than it was, say, like the week before, then we can start to maybe say, like, okay, we start to become a little bit more curious. Are there different stressors? How am I sleeping? How is my nutrition? Have I been as physically active as, as uh, I was previously? And so it can, it can serve as a little bit of a, a check-in. And um, I find uh, the, the calming uh, breath work can help with that. Thank you. Um, another question is, how can I help the people around me understand that movement abilities are unpredictable? How do I get them to understand that help is, is needed often? Yeah, that's, uh, it can be certainly a, a challenge, um, especially if you're not using mobility aids is, uh, uh, to make it a little bit more visible. Um, education is the, the biggest, one of the biggest pieces that uh, in, people can provide for their family. Um, and I would say getting them maybe to, to attend uh, uh, a session with the healthcare provider that's really knowledgeable and you feel really supported by and you would feel safe bringing them to uh, could be could be beneficial. Um, uh, just um, directing them to uh, websites such as the Fibromyalgia Association, um, uh, Pain BC, just to learn a little bit more about the, the challenges that, that come on a daily basis, especially with, with mobility and, and movement. Um, yeah, it's it, it's typically a struggle, especially for our close uh, social circles. Thank you. Um, mobility restrictions are our new normal, especially with flare up. Mm -hmm. What can I provide my employer with to help them truly understand what they are dealing with as an employee employer? Well, as an employee with fibromyalgia. Sorry. Are there workshops, documents or programs that companies can incorporate into their workplaces? I, I don't know the, the, the answer to that to kind of lead to like a direct resources for em, employers um, uh, to, to understand. Um, I kind of leading them again towards some of the more kind of like the PBC, the Fibromyalgia Association, those types of things would be, be really, really important. Um, it's uh, also would be important for them to kind of uh, uh, 
uh, make sure that your environment is is set up for success for you in, in the workplace. And so uh, whether that's ergonomic assessments or um, uh, being able to uh, structure breaks in a little bit different of a way um, that that might if if possible uh, those those types of things. Um, but uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure of anything kind of like handout or education resource for employees at this time. If anybody has anything, I would love it <laughs> if uh, if you could send it my way. <clears throat> so I will say that Fibromyalgia Association Canada are actually working on an a, what we call fact sheets for and we're presently working on one for employers of uh, people with fibromyalgia so we will announce that when it's uh, finished and ready to go and we'll send That's you a coffee amazing. tyler so. please do please do <laughs> thank you so much that'll be so helpful <laughs> so do you recommend if you're having a high pain or flare day do you recommend they keep do they exercise during that period and are there specific exercises you can do during that period to try to help? Well, it, it, it's a balance, right? And we do see that uh, uh, movement and, and physical activity has a short-term pain relieving effect. And so uh, this would be kind of a, an individual basis of what works, uh, what has worked kind of before and where they were. And so if the level of, of pain that you're experiencing um, uh, has kind of scaled you, scaled kind of your mobility and the restriction back, you would just want to start at a really like lower level of, of where you were. Um, maybe going into some of like the gentle, like isometric contractions and, and those types of things to help manage, manage the pain overall. Um, and taking uh, kind of a few days to kind of maybe work and just kind of move around, say, say your house or your kitchen, um, short walks to, to depending on the distance, maybe your mailbox at the end of your driveway, those those types of things. We we don't want to stop moving altogether. We just want to find a safe way to to do that um, uh, to kind of help manage that flare, and then kind of make sure that we're able to kind of move uh, forward from there. So this question says, due to many issues, I am gaining mid weight midsection. Mm -hmm. I am unable to do any high intensity workouts. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. So uh, anything, um, uh, any conversation around weight also has to come with like nutrition uh, as well. So seeking some nutritional support would certainly be um, uh, important. And there's, and it's not just it may be not be kind of like calories in, uh, calories out type of thing. Everybody's metabolism is completely different, but uh, making sure that we're getting uh, kind of good energy in our body is only going to help uh, kind of our health in, in the long run. Um, and uh, from a physical activity standpoint, from starting uh, starting out, um, it would be some of the things that we that I went over today. If because we really want to try to. Um, to get to some of like I would say the more more challenging type of movements and uh, kind of the overall goal being um, uh, the kind of the health guidelines and that would be you know one to three x one to three strength and training sessions a week um, looking at the ten major muscle groups and remember that can be three exercises so we would try to kind of structure something to work towards those. Um, about uh, anywhere from like about 20 minutes a day, kind of moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity and then movement flexibility kind of every day. So uh, we'd want to kind of start at a, at a level that you feel kind of safe. Can you contract your, your quads, your, um, uh, your, your chest, your arms? Uh, can you take some load through there and then being able to kind of progress? So what do you think of pain management apps? Oh, I think they're wonderful. I think they're wonderful, um, especially ones like uh, uh, Curable and um, uh, those those types of uh, ones, because uh, especially from uh, kind of you can get some really good ones with like pacing and that really structure in kind of like an education piece. And what we uh, if you're kind of looking at what you can potentially spend in kind of say coming to see see me right especially if you don't have insurance um uh, extended health insurance or um 
even if you do the amount, maybe the amount of sessions like that, that say, I don't know, fifty hundred dollar like investment um, could save you a couple of sessions um, uh, of, of education, right. And kind of get that, get that started for you as well. So, uh, and, and, uh, they're, they're really evidence-based, like the, the good ones are, are evidence-based and, and designed by, by professionals that, that really get this space. So, uh, finding the right one could be key. Um, I, I don't, I can't, I can't think of, there's, I know there's a couple out there, but the, the names are escaping me, uh, at this stage, but, um, uh, if you're, especially if you're able to do a little free trial to make sure that it's going to, the structure is going to fit for you and, and the program and the pace. Yeah, I recommend them. Well, thank you. So <clears throat> why does movement increase pain when people with fibromyalgia don't actually have any injuries? Yeah. And so it comes down to the, how the nervous system has, has learned to respond to that movement. And kind of going back to kind of like that, the yeah, kind of the definition, uh, kind of a pain and that that activity management, it, it it really comes down to kind of processing and, and the sense of safety. So when we when we kind of go through a, a movement, or the processing happens so fast, it says, you know what, this is this isn't safe. We got to let uh, this individual know. We got to let our body know you know, at this lead that we're not feeling comfortable here. So it becomes painful and that, that becomes a uh, very, very much automatic. And, a, and, and a lot of centers that we have no control over, this is kind of some more of the automatic centers of, of our brain. It becomes really powerful. Right. And, and we, um, we don't, you know, innately, we don't want to be in pain. Right. So movements that cause pain, um, are going to continue to get get sensitive over time. And so a lot of what we're trying to do here is just kind of change kind of the, I guess, our relationship with that movement and trying to create like, do you know what this actually is, is safe for us to be to be doing um, and trying to reduce that sensitivity and and kind of um, uh, and evaluate and see kind of where, where our, our nervous system is at. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tamara just noted that she just wanted to share that Pain Canada has a free online program called Live Plan B Plus. That seems pretty mm -hmm. good. Yeah. yeah. Are you familiar Amazing. with that one? Uh, no, no, I haven't. I haven't come across that one. That one yet. Um, do you think exercise like, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, yoga, tai chi, qigong are uh, safe exercises for people with fibromyalgia? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. And any movement that feels safe uh, to for individuals in any way that we're kind of moving our body is 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 good. But um, that comes with the, the, the our research is a little bit lower for kind of like overall effects with the symptom management of fibromyalgia with flexibility right now and the stuff that I've seen around the Cochrane reviews. Um, so kind of the I would say yes, from a general health standpoint, and we want to be making sure that you're moving your bodies in, in any way. The you know Tai Chi, Qi Gong, Yoga are wonderful for that. Um, uh, Neil Pearson is is does a lot with the the yoga, um, and I think he's out out in BC. Um, and we do want to be kind of the 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 best evidence that we see is in kind of the the. Um, like aerobic activity and and the strengthening um but uh, they they are safe especially if you're you take your time with it right um and so if you're you're interested in that you know watching videos make sure that it feels it looks visually safe to you and then just kind of gradually kind of doing it for maybe five five minute video ten minute video and just trying to progress your way up through um, some of those sequences there was a clinical trial, <clears throat> excuse me, back in 2009, 2010 era um, that the Nova Scotia Pain Clinic did on Qigong and fibromyalgia to see if that practicing Qigong <clears throat> would help people with fibromyalgia. And the results that came out of that study was 30 to 45 minutes a day practicing qigong actually did help people with not just their pain levels of fibromyalgia but also the cognitive 
and the brain fog. So it, it yeah. uh, I have to say I was part of that clinical trial. So I, um, it was, it was uh, beneficial actually to me. So. Yeah, totally. And like that, and the movement brings in like the, uh, especially those types of, of movements in, in Tai Chi and Qigong, and, like it brings in a, a very much a, a cognitive aspect to it. Uh, um, and it, it's, it's, it's very valuable, very valuable overall. It uh, focused on shutting your brain down, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, giving your brain a rest and uh, which is, really a pretty powerful tool so to be able to do that <clears throat> unfortunately i wasn't always able to do that so yes. but that that's the challenge right mm-hmm. <clears throat> so thank you very much tyler this has been great and i know that uh, not only the people who are attending today but the people who will see the recording will really appreciate this so it's how to get started there's so many of our community that are not able to get off the couch, that are not able to move at all. So it, it's very valuable and education is the key. Yes, it is. And uh, um, yep, be find, find where you're confident mm-hmm. yeah, and then move from there, move from there. Thank you for having me. This was, this was amazing. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. <laughs>